okay? I think it must switch off um, if it doesn't hear anything for a bit. So, uh, okay, generalized engine is very important, and uh, it's the process by which um, you uh, check whether your model performs on data which wasn't in your training set. So, machine learning, as I phrase it, is model plus data is equal to prediction. Um, the prediction on new data is dependent on the quality of the model and the quality of the data. This lecture, um, we're going to um, look at uh, basis function models and uh, see how their generalization capabilities vary as we change the number of bases. So last lecture, we introduced basis functions and we showed how to maximize the likelihood of a nonlinear mo model that was linear in its parameters. We just had to use something very similar to the multivariate linear regression. And we explore the different characteristics of different basis function models. That's a little. Uh, um, so we looked at some different basis sets, like radial bases um, and uh, Fourier bases and polynomial bases. Um, but today, we're going to look at uh, doing polynomial fits to that Olympics data, and we're going to sort of. It's what we did at the end of the last lecture, but we're going to go a bit extreme this time. So the question is. Um, we can choose different polynomial orders, and we can measure the error. So this is the error on the right-hand side. You're seeing the error on the training data. And this is the zeroth order polynomial, so it's just fitting the mean. So we want to know how well we're interpolating these points. Now, I'm plotting the root mean squared error. So that's uh, the thing we're measuring, which is the sum of squares, the thing we're trying to minimize. But it's the average sum of squares. So divide through by the total number of training data and then take the square root. And that's what I'm plotting. So it's the sort of expected how much out you are. So it's saying the average amount you're out is on sort of a standard deviation of how much you're out on average is, point, is around 0.3. Now, as I increase the model order, if I go to linear model, so that's the first order polynomial, I get a dramatic improvement in the uh, root mean squared error. If I go to um, quadratic, I get another improvement. If I go to the cubic, I get a further improvement. Quartic, it's actually a slight improvement. Quintic, improvement to the power of five, improvement. Everything keeps improving. I keep getting better and better. So by our error measure, as I increase the number of bases, in fact, if I even go as far as going to a 25 order polynomial, 26th order, I fit the data exactly, which is good, isn't it? So I've reconstructed my data perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> um, but in order to do so, I'm uh, experiencing some craziness in the polynomial. So the polynomial basis I've used here is actually, first of all, mapping it down to minus 1 to 1. So I'm trying to get at, rid of that problem of the fact that polynomials are badly behaved. Uh, for large numbers. So I'm scaling down, before I put it through the polynomial, I'm scaling down the data. Um, but you're still seeing that the where, it, where it behaves most dramatically is towards the edges. So I scaled down to a region between, I think, 1892 and 2012. I can't remember. You can check the code. Um, but you can still see it starts doing some crazy stuff here to interpolate these. Um, so this is a problem, right? Because here we've got, this error is actually 0. It's bang on 0. You actually get some numerical problems, and I've used the QR decomposition to make sure I can get this sort of fit. So what can we do um, to try and determine which model order? Because clearly not that one. We don't want that one. What about that one? Yes or no? No. Why not? Yeah, it goes, well, it just sort of does something crazy here, doesn't it? Uh, that one. <laughs> Um, that one. So it's interesting these effects here, right? Because this is the this bit here is the the two world wars. So I don't know. Does that fa does that flattening effect exist or not? I mean, I don't know. Well, but it's doing something crazy at the end. That one. Yeah, I don't know. They're all a bit crazy. So uh, how about that? Yeah. That's OK, is it? That one? Yeah, that one. So that one's what? Too simple? 
And uh, that one's what? Too complex? Yeah? Maybe it's okay. Actually, it depends how we're measuring. What are you looking at here? Are you looking at, when you're measuring, are you looking at, um, are you worried about the performance in here, or are you worried about the performance for predicting in 2020? Depends a bit on the question you're going to ask, doesn't it? It depends if you're worried about what the marathon pace is going to be in 2020, or if you're worried about what the marathon pace is going to be, was, should have been in 1944, sort of, uh, when they did, failed to have an Olympics. Um, okay, so how, how, do we, how do we measure this stuff? So what do we do? Does anyone know? In order to test our models, it's a process called validation. Um, and how, how can we validate? How can we determine which of these models to use? Using new data to use new data to reference. Absolutely, use new data. So instead of um, measuring performance on the training data, which is if we've got a strong enough model, is always going to go to zero. We use different data, new data. Well, actually, we don't have new data in this case because we can't. There are no additional Olympics. So we take some of our data. Um, and we uh, hold it out. So it's, it's sometimes called a holdout set. So let's say we were trying to predict the future. Then if we wanted to know what the right type of model to use, we'll have to do something like this. So I've, I've held out the Olympics from 1986 onwards. And now I'm going to see what the error measure is uh, as I um, fit this model. So here's, here's now the error measure for these held out data. It's again root mean square. Um, and as I increase the order this time, OK, so what happened? So the linear did OK. The quadratic did better. And the cubic did worse. Um, and then actually, the next one, the quartic, is so far off the plot, you can't see it. It just goes off the plot. And there's the quintic <coughs> and uh, the sixth order. Um, so. What we're seeing here is that we can measure the performance by holding out data. Um, now, there's a few sort of aspects about that. Do we, what, what's happening now that we've held out data? If we compare, say, this model here, was this the cubic model? And let's go back to the um, cubic model before. There's the cubic model before which does quite well on this training. Look particularly in this region here. And then if we go to the cubic model later, so what's happened as a result of uh, holding out that data? Pardon? It's, it's made a wrong prediction. Why is it making a wrong prediction in this region now? Whereas before in this region, the prediction was good. Yeah, but what have I done? Does this algorithm, holding out data, when we're doing a holdout data set, we don't show the algorithm, we don't show the model this data. So it doesn't know the data exists. So it's actually fitting less data than before. It has no idea about this here. The reason the cubic before goes through that region is because there's data in that region. All the models go through that region, broadly speaking. Oh, went too far. Yeah, because it's got data there. So it's seeing that data, and it's fitting in that region. So it's an interesting question how you decide to do your validation, because actually it's particularly difficult with time series like this. Because if we're trying to predict the future, um, <laughs> the right thing to do is to sort of somehow validate against uh, a future section of data. So hold out a section of data that we haven't seen before of what's coming. But if we actually throw that such data away, well, so what, what should we do, actually? So what we're, what we're saying is choose the quadratic by this validation score. But what should I do next? Should I now predict using the quadratic? So I choose the quadratic. I've done my validation. I'm choosing the quadratic. Should I now provide if, if um, when we're planning for Rio de Janeiro and we want to plan for how long to watch the marathon for, um, should I use this model? Why not? 
Yeah, so what can I do now, actually? Increase what, sorry? If I increase the base number, though, I've, what I'm, so I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to select according to this, um, I'm selecting a number. If I increase the base number, my performance on future data is getting worse. Yeah? So I don't need to increase the base number. What I'm using this for is to try and select the right number of bases to use. And this is telling me to use two bases. But once I've selected that number of bases, what should I do? Should I then provide, th is, this the mo is this the right model now to give to the client? No. Why not? Pardon? No, well, this is the best model given the ones we've selected. But is this the right model? What this is telling us is this is the choose a second order polynomial, actually. This is telling us that. Choose a second order polynomial. I'm not disagreeing with that necessarily, but should this be the second order polynomial I use? No. What should be the second order polynomial I use? The client gave me this data. I know I'm trying to predict into the future, so I've done my model selection by taking away the last section of the data. Yeah? Now I've fitted my model, and it's telling me to select this model. Would the client be pretty cross if I then fitted a model without using this portion of data? What should I be doing? Not even, we're going to come on to that. What should I just be doing here? If I'm choosing model order of second order polynomial, what do I do in this case? I'm not going to change anything in my holdout, but what should I now do? Could do, that's uh, going to be next week. <laughs> These are also good suggestions, but you're missing something so obvious. What do I now have to do? Pardon? Add, uh, part, add back in the part of the data. Thank you. So going back, what I should do now is actually not use that model, but use this model. This model is trained on this portion of the data as well. I'm only using that holdout data for um, validation. Once I've decided that I'm going to use the second order model, I can go back and refit it, OK? Now, this is a bit, this is frustrating, actually, because actually the data set is so small that taking away this portion of data is probably having a significant effect on even on the model order, order selection. Um, but when you're doing extrapolation, you're sort of a bit stuck. You can't do very much more. But people have mentioned some other ideas um, that we'll look at. So that's probably what I would do in this case, is, is something like that. In order to estimate the quality, the problem I face is, is I've got a trade-off, right? So I could use less data. So in some sense, I'm validating a model on that data set, right? I'm not validating a model on the whole data set, but I'm going to use the model for performance on the whole data set. But in order to get the validation score correct, I need to have some confidence. So here I've only used one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It's like even seven isn't enough about what my error measure is going to be. So this is my prediction, and I'm estimating the error over seven data points. And that's what I'm scoring here. So for example, um, if we were doing interpolation, things get a little bit better. So let me show you a little, um, well, let's just review what we mean by extrapolation. Yeah, I'm sorry. So I just want to understand something. You're saying that the validation is specifically taking out a group and then validating over just that group. The error, checking the error. That's a holdout validation. Oh, okay, I'm not understanding that then. That's a holdout validation. So there's lots of, we're going to see different types of validation. <coughs> so I'm just seeing the first sort of thing is the holdout validation. Why I want to focus on it a little bit is because in extrapolation, it always occurs to me that there's not much more you can do. Because extrapolation, you're looking for performance in a particular regime. Extrapolation is very difficult, like going predicting the future or trying to predict like, you know, what's going on outside the city, given what we know in the city. This is a really, really big challenge. 
So if you're trying to validate an extrapolation, there's not really much more that you can do than sort of set up the model to extrapolate and test how well it's extrapolating. And that, that really leaves you with this, this one technique, holdout validation. We'll see holdout validation being used in interpolation next. But extrapolation is a sort of major, it's the thing everyone kind of, in some sense, wants. They want to know what the stock market price is going to be tomorrow, and so on and so forth. But it's very, very hard. So it's, here it's predicting into the future. It could actually be predicting back into the past. It could be predicting sort of before 1892, where we've got no data. It's, just, it's actually very easy to think about in one dimension, because in one dimension, it's the case where you don't have data either side of the region you're predicting in. In two dimensions, it's also easier to think about. Um, so, you know, it's sort of outside some spatial region when you start. And then in higher dimensions, well, uh, you, can, you can find it in higher dimensions too. And, and this is quite difficult. So um, predicting, say, cholera rates outside Manchester given rates inside Manchester. They don't have cholera in Manchester at the moment. But one of my students is in... Um, Kampala at the moment, and there's a cholera outbreak in Uganda, and he's using Gaussian processes, or trying to use Gaussian processes as we speak, to do the spatial predictions of how cholera is moving across Uganda so that the UN can respond um, quicker. So, you know, these are very real problems. How, how does cholera move across the country? Now, actually, they don't do any, they're trying not to do extrapolation. They have health centers, 4,000 health centers across the country, and they're getting data from all these health centers. So, broadly speaking, they're interpolating. Um, so, interpolating is much easier. So, So this is an amazing thing about Alan Turing. He was a formidable marathon runner. He ran in 1946 a marathon time, and it's easy to remember because it's, if you remember the 46, 1946 of two hours, 46 minutes. So Alan Turing is, um, you know, he's, he's, he's a, a, father, a founding father of computer science. He's actually in many ways a founding father of a lot of things done in machine learning. If you actually look at all the stuff he was doing at Bletchley Park, it was all secret at the time. But a lot of the things they were doing in Bletchley Park were trying to do probabilistic inference to try and understand um, uh, what the right um, crib on a code was, or to try and pick up cribs to try and do code breaking. So code breaking is, can be seen as a sort of specific type of what we're trying to do in machine learning. You have some data and you're trying to do some inference. But in 1946, Alan Turing, when he ran the national championships, and you'll see it in your labs, he was only 11 minutes, minutes slower on the marathon than the winner of the 1948 games. That's extraordinary, isn't it? If he were to run that marathon speed today in the London Marathon, he would be amongst the top 10 Brits or something, I don't know. Uh, he was um, maybe not top 10, but he would be very high up. It's extremely difficult to run a marathon in two hours 46. Extremely difficult. People will now sort of train, you know, using modern scientific methods to break a three hour marathon. Um, and the best runners um, do it in about two hours sort of 30. The international standard elite will do it in two hours 10. But that was already extremely difficult. He was only 11 minutes slow. He used to go running apparently around Bletchley Park and thinking about the challenges he was facing. Um, and uh, he, used to really put himself in a lot of pain while he was running. He must have done in order to be that fast. So would he have won a hypothetical games had one been held in 1946? This is the sort of thing we're interested in. If we're doing interpolation, then that becomes interpolation. So if we want to know um, whether Alan Turing would have won a 1946 Olympic Games, because we have the 1936 and 1948 games, um, we can we can interpolate. So if we want to test this sort of generalization, interpolation, we can do something a little bit better or easier. Uh, so we, we now sample the validation set from throughout the data set. So that point about the extrapolation is I just want you to be aware that if you're going to do testing a model for extrapolation, you have to be worried about, you have to think about your validation set, what you're going to be using the model for, because um, that affects how you should choose your validation set. Because actually you get quite different answers when you do interpolation. So what I've done now, because we're interested in interpolation, is left out a holdout set. So we're going to average the number of the error across these points from a holdout set. And we'll see what performance is. So here we're starting again with the zeroth order model. Um, the first order model actually does worse. <laughs> 
Um, second order model does considerably better. Oh, third order model is missing from our, um, let's go back, go back. Third order model there does better. So third order is looking good. Fourth order, slightly worse. Fifth order, slightly worse. Sixth order, better. There we go, it's better. It is better. You may not think it's better because you're looking at this part here and it's falling off, but we're not testing extrapolation anymore. We're testing in interpolation. None of these points are in the data set and it's doing a damn good job on those two. It's gone right between them. It's also happens to be going up and down in here. <laughs> so right, so now we choose the sixth order model. Is that right? Yeah? <coughs> Two, three, or six? Anyone. Anyone. What's going on now? What, why is this plot doing like this? Why, did the, why was the zero thought of better? I mean, is it, okay, so let's think about uh, why, why is the mean, why was the model the mean better than the first order model for a, for a start? Let's go back, let's have a look. Why, why is the model with the mean better than the first order model. So you can see the holdout data is what we're measuring things on. That's the points in green. And the training data is the points in red. Why is that model? What's going on that that model is somehow better than the first order model, which we would probably all think, oh my, well, at least, at least get the trend decreasing. I mean, so what's going on? Yeah, how, you mean uh, equal and um, what, so say what you mean by that? Sorry. Uh, so that when calculating error, I think uh, the error will be low if equal number of points are across the line. If e equal number of points are across the line, um, yeah, that's true. So that is the distribution of points relative to the line is important. Yes. So what goes on? It, what happens to be, yeah, so actually you, what you're, I think what you're hinting at is, look, all the greens are below the line. Um, but actually this model, we would expect this model on average to have a better error. So I don't really think that this is a, um, so it's true that the greens seem to be mainly below, but on average I would still expect the linear model to have a better error than the constant model. But why isn't that the case for this example? Testing data is too small. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The amount of validation data we're using is so low that it's just noise, sample noise. Just so happens, look at this, just so happens, and this is totally random. I, I didn't even sort of really notice this until about 20 minutes ago. Just so happens that the data we've selected to validate on doesn't include any of these one, two, three, four points. It's all around this region here. It's all in a sort of tunnel. And even then, it happens to be, it doesn't even include the extreme ends here. So it's just coincidence. Just coincidence. We're only using, you can have coincidences like this because we're only using one, two, three, four, five, six, seven points. You can't tell anything from seven points. And the whole thing is coincidence. I mean, not the whole thing. There's some signal here, but basically what we're seeing is sample error. It is not the case. Probably might be the case. It is not the case that the model order is going to get worse and then better again, I don't think. We don't normally expect that. Could be, could be the case. But we don't normally expect something like that. But what we're mainly seeing here is sample noise. This is just a noisy plot, right? So you're human beings, so you tend to look at it as something that's going up and down, but it's actually quite probable that a lot of this movement is just noise. If we were to try and test whether this is any signal or there's noise, it probably would say not much signal. There must be some signal in there. So what can we do about this? Because now we've got a validation set. It's distributed within. So it's not suffering that problem that we were extrapolating. Um, what, how can we deal with this? Someone mentioned something about this before. Some other points and calculate 
Yeah, do it multiple times. So the most extreme thing we can do is actually something called leave one out error. Leave one out cross validation. So one thing we can do is take the whole training set and remove one point and train on the remaining data and test on that one point. OK, but now that's, going to be, that's made the situation worse. How stupid is that? Ah, but then the trick is we then do it 27 times or 26 times for this data, removing a different point at every time, and then we average the error. It's called the leave one out cross validation error, and it's sort of the gold standard validation technique. Um, it's because it really, it's nice because what it does, it's not suffering before when we were taking all that data out, the sort of five data points, we're actually reducing our data set size by like 20%. So the model order we're choosing is not the model order for the data we have, it's the model order for a much smaller data set. If we take one data point out, we're choosing a model order for still a smaller data set, but with one missing. Um, and then we can deal with this problem, this challenge of the fact that if we're only measuring the error on one data point by averaging it, doing it for every data point. And that gives us an averaging effect. So let's see if we can see this. What, what I'm showing here, watch the green dot move. Can you see it moving? Can I zoom in a bit? Shall I zoom in a bit? Let's zoom in a bit. Ignore the thing on the right. I'm not sure why that's plotted. I didn't have time to fix it. Um, just watch on the left. What's going on is we're just, we're, um, as, we, as that green dot moves, so I'm only showing the first five because showing 27 is a bit boring. Look at the blue line. Yeah? Do you see the blue lines moving? What's going on is I'm leaving out one point at a time. Notice when I leave out this point here, it moves the most. It doesn't move that much, but it moves the most. Yeah? Between the two. There, it's not moving at all. It's just the frame moving as I move, yeah? Yeah? Now, so what's going on is I average all those by leaving every single data point out, and I test the error, and I take the average of the whole thing. And I do that then for the first order model as well. Second order model, third order model, fourth order model, fifth order model, sixth order model. Now, interesting, we're still getting some effect here where the sixth has dropped down. So I'm not quite sure why that is. But uh, we're seeing a much smoother effect in terms of the, this is the mean, this is the linear, where we get the biggest jump. And then this is the quadratic. There's not that much difference, actually, between the quadratic and the cubic. Very similar under this interpolation score. Um, but now we're actually managing to see the whole thing. Yeah? So, and then the quartic gets worse, the quintic's worse, and then I'm not sure what's going on with the uh, sixth order. So this is called the leave one out cross-validation error. Um, and there are aspects about it I really like. Like, oh, sorry, I should have... Um, I meant to include another... Um, hmm. Okay, I'm missing a bit. There are aspects about it I really like, but those aspects are also reflected in um, a decomposition of the error. So one of the things that's going on is, I'm not going to get you to derive these decompositions, but these decompositions are kind of important. What I want you to think about is, well, just listen and uh, look at this equation. What's this equation saying? This equation is just the sum of squares error, right? Now, this f star here, what we're saying, we're doing a funny little thing. We're saying the expectation of this is taken under all the possible training sets, OK? So imagine that we do have Olympics running forward in time continuously, and we could take any sample, perhaps, any sample of when people, we could get, we could just go out, get the gold medalist, get them to run a marathon, find out what the Olympics is at any time. What this is saying is that we can, that this is the error of what we'd get from the expectation under the training set. So this expectation is our estimate given all the possible training sets. 
Now, but this thing decomposes into this thing called the bias variance decomposition. The bias turns out to be error due to our model being overly simple. And the variance turns out to be error due to our model being overly complicated, potentially. So what happens is we get a high bias error for that constant movement, and we get a high variance error for the overfitting things. Now, we're not going to look too carefully at the decomposition, but I want to look at those two terms in separately. And we're going to come back and look at the leave one out cross-validation error after we do that. So this expectation, it's a funny expectation. It's not like any other expectation we'll look at in the course. It's an expectation over this, like, it's what, this is our, like, training function. It's the expectation given our entire sort of training mechanism and a given training data set. So it's like all possible training sets we could be given, and it's the expected value of our training function. Now, when we're looking, the reason I like to introduce this after the leave one out cross-validation error is when we were looking here, we can imagine that, let's say, now we're, est we're somehow estimating this expectation at the moment because we've got a given training set. There's only one given training set we're given. But there's a sort of technique of, sort of saying, well, let's pretend we've got 27 different training sets and let's look at how our predictions behave. So that expectation is talking about how this prediction function moves as the training set varies. And the answer is it doesn't move very much. Now, let me go to the, um, so I've dropped something off the slides and not noticed, but I've got it on my old slides. So uh, so just going into the um, PDF version of the slides. So let's look at that again with the leave one out. You can see it's broadly the same stuff. Um, here we go. Uh, oh, let's save this. Um, Right, we'll go to the PDF slides just for this bit. Um, okay, yeah, look, so on the PDF, it's sort of a... <laughs> so I've got the whole thing on the PDF, which is I want to show you the PDF. Look at how much the line moves as I leave each point out. Very little. Now, what the bias error is, is the expected value of our output function minus the actual value of the true function across the whole function. Um, the error is going to be very large. This thing doesn't move. And it's constantly missing the data. So the bias error is very large. Um, what happens if I go to the high... Uh, so this is... <laughs> As we start getting, um, okay, so what you should see now is that as I change the data set, the function's moving more, right? The function moves more, but it, in the base case, it stays closer to the data. So the average location of the function is closer to the data but the function moves more. But its average location is good, right? But the function does move more. It's, like it's more sensitive to sort of changing data. So particularly if I take this data point out there, look how much it moves. It moves considerably. So this, this function has low bias. It's a complex function and it has low bias. But what it turns out to do is it has high variance. So. This is the problem for the bias variance dilemma. Um, so, 
So the variance is this. <coughs> the variance is that's the thing we were looking at before, the expected position of the function over all the different training sets. We can't actually measure that, right? We're, we're just seeing some sort of estimate as if we slightly vary our training sets. And this is the um, actual, uh, so this is the expectation of the square between the expected distance and the variation around that distance. And that moved a lot more. So complex functions <coughs> move an enormous amount. If you think about back, going back to the linear function, which we have on here, so I can show you, the linear function doesn't have high variance. Uh, oh, which one am I doing? This one here. Ah. Um, the linear function tends to stay close to its expected value across all values. Even this largest value, that's the largest deviation away it takes. So it's got low variance. <coughs> but it's got high bias because it's fundamentally failing to predict the data. It's missing the data. Now this is conceptually, you can look at the derivation, it's there on Wikipedia, um, you can go through the derivation, but the important thing about this thing is the conception of what goes on is that you've got this constant trade-off this is the error we want to minimize across all data sets. And we've got this constant trade-off between error due to being too simple. But those simple models, they tend not to change. As the data sets change, they tend to predict the same. I mean, let's think about if we were trying to predict the height of people in this room. It's every time we take someone out of the room, if I'm just predicting by the average height of who's in the room, that value won't change. I'm not going to get a very good prediction. The variance on the prediction is just the variance of the data set in that case. I'm not going to get a very good prediction, but the variance isn't going to change. If I start taking into account other things like gender and other sort of information, I can remove that bias, but actually I start to get into this regime where variance starts to go up. So as I'm getting the overly complicated model, I start to have different predictions. The really interesting thing about it, you can get high variance, even if your model is correct. Even if, let's say, um, you know, somehow the speeds of runners was really being sampled according to a polynomial. So we were getting, the, 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 way, the way we were getting an Olympic result was someone was sampling from a polynomial, say a sixth order polynomial. It wouldn't mean necessarily that the variance, uh, well, we, that removes bias because we have the capability if we use a sixth order polynomial. But even when we use the sixth order polynomial, we tend to get high variance because we don't have enough data to determine the parameters of the sixth order polynomial. So variance error comes uh, from, even if you've got the right level of complexity of the model, um, you don't have enough data to justify that complexity. As you get more and more data, variance error reduces. So what's going on at the moment a lot you see in machine learning is people are using very complex models, these deep neural networks, so on and so forth. Um, they're all about getting rid of bias, going for a very complex model. And then they're using them with billions of data, which gets rid of variance. But in the regime we're in at the moment where you've got low data, it's a tricky problem because you have, to, you have this bias variance decomposition, but it leads to something called the bias variance dilemma, which is that you either have to choose a model which gives you high bias or a model that choose, it gives you high variance. Um, if you choose a model that's too simple, you get high bias. If you choose a model that's uh, complex enough, you tend to get high variance when you've got low data. Um, and doing this sort of model selection of doing leave one out cross validation error is a way of trying to resolve that trade-off empirically to get the best model. OK. Uh, now, a problem with the... Um, uh, the problem with the leave one out cross validation is, uh, well, let's talk about the problem with the leave one out cross validation. So, what could be a problem with the leave one out cross validation as a way of measuring this? So, 27 data points. How many times do I have to fit the model for each model order? 26 data points for this. How many, how many times do I have to fit the model? 26 times, yeah. And if I'm testing um, seven different complexities, I have to do it for each complexity. So I have to do it seven times, 26 times. How many times would I have to fit the model if there's a thousand data points in my data set? A thousand times. So it's like the gold standard, leave one out cross validation error is like the gold standard approach. 
Now, it is true sometimes, uh, for example, for Gaussian processes, there are some models where you can estimate the leave one out cross-validation error without retraining the model. That's a pretty cool trick. We're not going to see it in the course, but there's, um, there's tricks um, for uh, removing a data point from a fully trained model that you can do mathematically sometimes. Not for like neural networks, but for Gaussian process models, kernel-based models. And you can estimate this leave one out cross-validation score very quickly. Um, which is nice. But in general, it costs. If we, it, with that, you have to know about the model. You have to know about the maths to do that. If you're viewing the whole process as a black box, and that's the beautiful thing about the validation techniques I'm showing you today, we're using these sum of squared error scores, which allows to do the bias variance decomposition. But you can use any error score you like. And all the validation techniques we're talking about apply today. All you have to be able to do is train and run the model, right? You don't actually have to even know how the model is trained and how the model is run. Um, knowing how to validate a model is probably the most important thing you'll have to do if you're ever doing working with a uh, data prediction. Or being able to test whether someone else knows how to validate a model is important as well. So what we do, instead of leaving every data point out, is we do the so-called uh, so k-fold cross-validation. So k-fold cross-validation. Um, you need to train the model n times for leave one out. The alternative is k-fold cross-validation. We do what we did before with that sort of interpolated holdout data set, but we do that multiple times, taking every section of the data set out. So it's sort of a combination of these two ideas. So in k-fold cross-validation, you sort of say, you select five points to validate, you train on the other 21 points, and then you select a different five sets of points to validate, train on the other 21. And then you do that till you've trained on all and tested on all with disjoint sets. It's got the same issue that you're only training on 80% of the training data. So your estimate of the model complexity is probably going to be slightly wrong um, because you're using less data for your training than you really have. Um, once again, you know, I would, I would myself, once I've selected my model complexity, there's a strong argument for then retraining on all the data. The argument against that is you haven't validated the model you've just done, so you have to be confident in your training mechanisms. So here is the sort of k-fold cross-validation. So notice, of course, that the line moves a bit more because we're leaving five out at a time. Um, I've left off the uh, errors because I think that's an exercise in the lab class for you to play with that. So. Um, Oh, sorry, it's only really there for the k-fold. So in the, k in, the, in the first order, in the first order, you see we're missing out each section at a time. And we estimate the error for each one. So we do that five times. And then we can plot the model order again. OK, so there's this section in uh, the Rogers and Girolami book about validation. Um, I think validation is perhaps, you don't have, you can, if you forget everything else I've taught you in the course, it kind of, um, you, and you still remember the, how you validate models, then that can always be useful, like in your future. If you're ever sort of dealing with someone who's predicting things, um, knowing whether they validated the model correctly, even if you're not doing it yourself, is a sort of really important lesson in uh, data science. And the techniques I've shown you are sort of standard techniques that don't really require you to have any specific knowledge. You know, you just have to be able to, you can black box the algorithm and the prediction, right? So if, if I give you a box and I say you press, you insert data here and press this button to train, and then you press this button to test, that's all you need. Uh, yeah, I mean, you've got your test things, you can invent your own test score, you can invent your own criteria. But what's important is the design well, the, we just use squared error. Squared error might not be the right um, error measure to use. Um, it could, in some cases, it can, it can be a bad error measure to use. Um, we've done a particular design of how we've taken the data points. So how we did it in the first place, he said, well, if we're looking into the future, we should be taking the last five and predicting those. But then this did lead to these problems that they were basically not predicting in that region. So we did our model order selection. And I said, well, here, you know, I would really advise including those five data points. Um, so you have to sort of think about these sort of decisions. Um, then for interpolation, we could subset select from different areas in the curve. 
Um, but then if you've got too few data, you get errors with these sort of noisy things. So then we look at five-fold cross-validation um, and leave one out cross-validation. Uh, perhaps a nor more normally used one would be tenfold cross-validation. I didn't do tenfold cross-validation here because it's too close to leave one out cross-validation, right? Because it's tenfold is leave two data points out each time rather than five. So actually, generally, people would do tenfold cross-validation. That's a nice trade-off. You're training on 90% of the data, but you have to do uh, 10 times. So um, in the lab class this afternoon, you're going to um, end up writing your own code for doing um, validation on the Olympics data. So here you're going to get, look, oh, that's the most important bit, actually. That is the national championships. I mean, that's amazing. So the one bit you're going to learn today, even if you don't remember, it's going to be on the exam. How fast did Alan Turing run the marathon? It's underlined here. It's in, it's in a, Dr. A. M. Turing, two hours, 46 minutes. I think he's like 11th in the national championships. Uh, it's, the winner was two hours, 33 national champion. And in those days, Britain was quite good at the marathon. <laughs> I think we even won the gold. Um, and he's only uh, 13 minutes behind. I think that's extraordinary. So that's the sort of motivating question for this marathon data. Um, and uh, then there's a little bit more detail about empirical risk, holdout validation. Um, and then you start doing uh, the holdout data. Um, and then you look at leave one out validation and then k-fold cross validation, yeah? Um, oh, I meant to add the thing on the biospherence dilemma there, yet. I haven't done that yet, okay? So you're gonna have to do this code. So the main thing you're gonna be doing is basically training models, write good code for your training of the models because you're basically gonna be repartitioning, taking data out and retraining the model on the remaining data. Um, so you've gotta, there's things like, uh, I think, yeah, np.random.permutation turns out to be useful. Because the thing you do not want to do is just remove what, you notice when I was doing take five out, apart from the extrapolation case, I'm removing those five from random locations. And in order to do that well, you need to do like permutation commands on your data to sort of reorder the data. Um, and that's very good practice in general. If ever you're randomizing data, do not take like the first five point outs and the next five points. Even if you think your data order has been randomized, it may well not have been. So the best thing to do is to always randomize the order of the data. And this permutation just gives you a random order of points. So you say np.random.permutation 10, and that will give you a random reordering of those 10. And then you can split the partitions on those. It's absolutely vital that you properly randomize when you're doing cross-validation. Or else, I mean, let's say I just took some data. It looked like it was in a random order, but I don't know what the person's done. So what, all I'm doing is just effectively flipping the rows around beforehand. So that's crucial. Um, of course, it doesn't matter for leave one out cross-validation because uh, uh, you're just moving one point at a time. It doesn't matter how you select that single point. OK, so see you at, um, well, any questions and, uh, at that point? can digest that over a coffee, discuss it amongst your friends. And we'll uh, put it into practice in an hour's time. What is the optimum size of k-fold? Well, the optimum size of k-fold would be k equals n. In, uh, in terms of estimating your cross-validation error, that would be the best thing to do. But computationally, that's the most expensive because it's n times slower. So typically, people use 10. We're using 5 because the data set is so small. But very often, you'll see people using 10. And the trait... And the trade-off is that the, the larger k, the longer it takes. The smaller k, the greater the mismatch between what you're validating on and actually the amount of data you have. So you could actually use a more complex model. So you sort of, you, you tend to, what tends to happen when you've got low data is you tend to err towards bias error, right? You tend to sort of have an overly simple model because it becomes better determined. So if you have a sort of, if you did like twofold cross validation, train on half, validate on, on the other half, you tend to have a much simpler model than you could get away with, right? Your data would allow you to, your data, more data, you reduce variance error. So, um, you know, 
by ignoring that data, you're not properly estimating uh, how, how low you can get that variance error. And so you tend to choose a simpler model in general. Yeah? OK? Right, see you in an hour's time.